We live, Steve? We are. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Bill Levine from uh, ASCS. And this is week two of our ASCS Virtual Fellows Conference core curriculum. Uh, we're really thrilled to have three outstanding shoulder elbow surgeons and members of ASCS tonight. We have Grant Garrigues, who's going to be moderating tonight from Chicago, from Rush. Uh, we have Vani Sabaston, who's down in Florida at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and we have Josh Dines from New York City and Hospital for Special Surgery. Uh, and um, for the fellows uh, who are um, uh, participating, please send your questions in through the chat box format. And uh, Ranjan Gupta and Gus Mazaka, who are our ASCS education co-chairs and help put together this series, uh, will be monitoring uh, those questions as they come in. And without further ado, Grant, take it away. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks for the introduction. I'd also like to thank the ASCS. I know uh, Steve, uh, Stella, and Lisa are on the line and everyone that worked to put this together on short notice. And thank all the fellows for, for joining us here. You're really lucky to be part of the uh, ASCS family. As you can see in tough times like this, we come together and uh, geek out on shoulder stuff. So I'll turn it over to Josh Dines. We were assured no PowerPoint, but because he <laughs> talked so quickly, He's been allowed a special dispensation to have a few slides. Josh, take it away. <laughs> All right, can I, I gotta share my screen. Steve, can you, okay, perfect. So yes, as Grant said, I'm gonna basically just give five slides. Bill's gonna have a stroke, but the five slides will take less than one minute. <laughs> but um, we might need a new moderator or you know, overseer uh, by the time I'm done. But, but basically, you know, why you're here, we're talking about the failed rotator cuff and what really troubles us. So just to kind of set the stage, um, the good news is when you guys start in practice in a, in a few months, 90% of the time they, they heal and even more, a higher percentage of that do great. Clearly there's kind of 10% where it doesn't heal and whether that's a failure of biology at the tendon bone interface, poor tissue quality of the tendon itself, or even muscle issues, um, you know, those things you're gonna to wanna to think about as to why the repair didn't work. I promise no basic science, so I'm not even gonna talk about this slide. Just a couple things to keep in mind as you listen to the history and when you're indicating patients for surgery, and especially as you see the cases tonight, which is really going to be Josh, the focus. You know, Josh, Josh, we don't, see your slides Josh we don't see your slides that we're not yeah. supposed to be seeing. That, that was for you, Bill. That's weird. Let's see. That's crazy. Perfect. Yeah, exactly as you ordered. Share your um, screen. No, uh, thanks. <laughs> Any better? Here it comes. Yeah, here it comes. Yes, now we got it. Perfect. So I've already wasted three minutes, but 90% of the time they do great. We talked about the reasons why they might not. Forget you even saw that basic science slide. But really, when you're taking a history, listening to your patient, which is critical, um, listen, you know, there are clearly factors that we know are associated with repair failure. And one of those being older age. Um, as tears get larger, things you're going to pick up on MRI, which we'll see tonight, increasing size of the tear or a higher grade gutelier classification. A deficient anterior cable uh, is going to affect your outcomes potentially, the chronicity of the tear, and the osteoporotic bone. One other thing to think about that, that's always got to be in the back of your mind when, when things are going wrong in shoulder surgery, and that's C acnes, you know, P acnes, now C acnes. But we know that it's out there. Um, just even in asymptomatic patients, up to 15% of the time, and even higher in some series. And just, you know, the, the infection rate could be almost 9%. Um, I'm sorry, nine per 1,000 cases. So not 9%, but it's got to be something that you're thinking about as you hear these cases tonight and as you're in practice on your own. You, you've done a great repair, not doing well for some reason. Make sure these are on your radar. So I know Bill said no slides. We, we just wanted to put a few and now I'm done. Perfect. Thanks, Josh. Back to you, Brad. So, uh, now for the remainder, uh, we'll, be, we'll be throwing some cases up. So I'll throw, show a case uh, that we can discuss. So please, if you have questions, use the chat window. Again, the focus here is, is problems that you see. What bothers you in clinic? Those rotator cuffs that just won't heal, rotator cuff patients that are having trouble. This is all about kind of those problem children you see in clinic. So I'm going to share my screen here. We're going to pull this up here. And we're going to dive right in with a case. So, all right. I'm calling this the workers comp scrabble. So it's a 53 year old right hand dominant woman. She works in retail. She's lifting something over the overhead at, uh, while at work, feels a tearing sensation and turns out to have a torn uh, rotator cuff. 
Her past medical history is significant for hyperlipidemia and hypercholesterolemia. That might be relevant as multiple basic science uh, studies as well as uh, population studies have shown that those are risk factors for cuff um, tear. And she had a rotator cuff tear by one of my, my partners who's an excellent, excellent surgeon. So the pictures are a little uh, poor and I apologize for that. This is a few years ago on our old EMR, but patient had a biceps a tenotomy, had this in the upper right, if you can imagine, uh, that's a supraspinatus tendon tear. It's retracted just to the medial edge of the footprint. The treating surgeon did a single row repair um, with triple loaded uh, suture anchors and felt like the tissue quality was good. So again, uh, not a large tear, a small tear, uh, not a smoker. It was a worker's comp patient, which is a um, correlate with poor outcomes, but, but again, single row repair. So thought this patient would do well. Unfortunately, we're in a talk on rotator cuff complications. So you know they're not gonna do well. And seven months after the index operation, the patient was almost at MMI, kind of doing the work conditioning phase, uh, then went back to work. And then while at work, as just back at work, like a week or two, feels, feels another tearing sensation. So at this point, the workers comp attorney is very excited. This is gonna be extra, um, you know, definitely a triple, uh, triple letter score for this patient with a double workers comp uh, injury. So comes back to that treating physician, incisions are well healed, not stiff. The patient was very compliant with physical therapy, had no stiffness, but did have weakness with empty can testing and pain with resisted external rotation, one of the most sensitive signs for cuff tearing. So this is the x-ray looks fine again. MRI shows a re-tear of the rotator cuff. So you can see that anchor there. You can see the cuff tear there. So, so again, double, double word score, double cuff tears in a worker's comp patient. So now the treating surgeon says, well, um, okay, we did the single row repair. Uh, I see everything seemed to go well. We're gonna take the patient back. Took him back. Tissue quality Grant, looked good. Grant, the tear basically second? looked the same as the Grant. first time. Maybe slightly smaller, but effectively the Grant. same. You can, can see. You hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Brad. Josh. Sorry, I'm just looking at the uh, the chat. Um, uh, Ron John wants us to ask, you know, before we go any further, if we were done any, if Vani and I would have done anything differently at the original repair. Yeah, good question. Um, I get How no, about that you, was Josh? Ron John's Why don't you question. Take that one? So, um, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020, but that being said, I still, you know, the, the tissue quality looked good. Uh, this sounded like an acute tear. You know, those ones that typically would heal well. That said, I would have done a double row repair. I mean, I think. You know, it, it was looked like it was isolated supraspinatus just from the one picture you showed, but it did extend to the anterior cable, uh, which which I mentioned is clearly a risk factor for these failing to heal. And it, you know, it looked like you know just based on the, that one picture, it looked like it may have even extended into the infraspinatus just based on the amount of footprint exposed, uh, which makes it you know a larger tear. I think there was room for more anchors, uh, especially laterally. It's going to give a better biomechanical construct. So for me, that's my go-to as a double row if the, if there's enough tissue. And I did think there was in this case. So yeah, guys, I, I, have a question, I have a really good question for all of you, which is from the group, from panels. At what point when the repair is going, when in the post-operative period, do you get a repeat MRI when the patient ap appears to be failing clinically? Nine months, a year, when, 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 assuming that there's no trauma. Bonnie, why don't you take that one? You know, you know, I, I think probably to me the threshold is usually about six months. It depends. I mean, I think that you know, there's a lot of things that talk about maybe regression. So I really look for the fact that a patient sort of is moving forward and then suddenly regresses. That to me, I don't think there's a timing on that. In those cases, if a patient's doing great and then suddenly something happens, it, it's a red flag to me. You know, and then I think by the six month point, if the patient has sort of built that strength up and I don't see a lot of, you know, del deltoid apnea, they've gotten some reasonable range of motion, but yet strength or something is still a factor that kind of puts my threshold up to consider it. What do you think, Josh Brandt? I don't know. Uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think it's, you know, I agree with you. I think there's no hard and fast time. I think in the absence of an acute event, for me, it's as you highlighted, kind of progression and how they're progressing. You know, I don't expect much for the first three months. so. I don't really, I, I have a very high threshold to have to order an MRI then, but once you get past three months, if they're kind of worse at a, a subsequent visit than they were the one before, pain's getting worse, symptoms are getting worse, I'll have a low threshold to get an MRI at that point. Um, and then by, you know, definitely by six months if they haven't made progress. But for me, it's really kind of, you know, seeing them two visits apart if there's a lack of an acute event. Okay. And, and you, Can I ask real quick for you guys, you know, does anyone use ultrasound? What do you guys think about that? 
So, uh, Bonnie, I'll take that one and then I'll answer the question Ron would ask. So, I use ultrasound only for guided injections. I don't feel like my, even though there's the ion audience, GLE stuff says 85% accurate, I feel like I'm not as accurate, um, you know, with detecting a retear as an MRI uh, would be in my hands. And to Ranjan's question, I think the implication behind what you asked is we all know that if you get an MRI early, it's going to look like a bomb went off in there. You know, if you get an MRI within three, four months of surgery, be prepared for the radiologist to say, you know, high marrow signal cannot rule out, you know, osteomyelitis around the anchors. I mean, those bone anchors cause a lot of bleeding and hemorrhage. The cuff will not look normal. So, you know, you're going to call, you're going to have more questions and answers if you do it within three, four months after that, like you said, if the trajectory, that's when the patient should be kind of on their final glide path. And if they're not, as Bonnie and Josh said, that's when I'm going to, going to re-image them. That's, so a, great, anyone yeah, that's get, a great point. So, uh, Roger, so would anyone get the MRI I, before six months? Yeah, I think, you know, yes, yeah. depending on how they're doing. If I see somebody at, you know, three months and they were doing really well, I sort of cleared them to start increasing their activity. And all of a sudden, by four and a half months, their motion's worse, their pain's worse, then I'd, I'd have no problem getting an MRI at four and a half months. The point I was going to make just for the fellows along the lines of what Grant was saying is that, you know, part of the art of medicine is really kind of coaching your patient through that period where an MRI is not going to help you. So they're, they're going to hurt at six weeks. They're going to hurt at three months. I explained to them that, you know, you're, you're kind of getting a snapshot in time. You don't know if things are still healing or they're heading in the wrong direction there. So, you know, it, it may not be a very useful if you're just having, you know, without an acute event. So I try to, you know, sort of slow roll getting repeat imaging until I'm at least outside of that three month mark. And then I'd have a lower threshold. You know, I think the other thing too is just, you know, I think the MRIs are not always conclusive. And, and sometimes I think when you're early in your practice, you order a lot of them. And then I feel like with time and age, you realize it really is a toughest situation to, to order because then you have an explanation that you don't know what to do with. And, you know, I think that the, a point got brought up a little bit on just the regression idea. You know, what is that? What are we looking at with that? You know, and I think that that acute event idea, the idea of maybe just there's something that happens and they have a sharp decline. I do think in those cases, if you delay it, it's harder to then go back in and re-repair it. Your chances of a revision repair with time um, deteriorate. I do believe that. And I think there's a lot of literature to show that timing is a lot of the critical component of a lot of these things. The other thing That's I would a comment on. Monty. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Josh, please. No, I was just gonna say, the, you know, a, a part of you know, the history, getting back to the history here, it's a work comp patient. Um, you know, there are times where you know they are clearly, you know, th that's clearly a, a risk factor for not a great outcome. So, uh, if you know, sometimes I'm confident that they're doing well, their strength is good. Uh, you know, they're still complaining. That's times where sometimes I almost get the MRI to kind of prove them that everything looks good, and, and you know, now it's on them. Now they've got to kind of you know work a little harder. They're they're sort of clear to get a little more aggressive in terms of their motion and their strength because everything is healed. So um, that you know, not always, but but if you think there's an element of malingering, um, that might help at least. Or, you know, you get a, get an ultrasound where you know, maybe you can't see it as well, and at least you can spin it that it's, it looks healed. And so, I mean, just so one good study uh, that that one of my fellow fellowship mentors, Mark Lazarus, used to always quote Gary Gartsman did a study where they asked people in the first six weeks after rotator cuff repair, what did you feel like you did something that may have compromised your repair? And 85% of people said that they felt, oh, I, I grabbed the shower, uh, the uh, shampoo, or that, you know, the dog ran at me, or the cell phone dropped, or whatever. They had some jerking motion, 85% of people. So I always quote that to patients, say, listen, this is a universal part of the experience. I mean, the vast majority of patients will think they did something that damaged them, and then they ultrasounded all those patients in the study, they were all fine. So I think that's, um, as Josh said, providing some reassurance early on, because the imaging, if you get it early, is going gonna, is gonna to cause more questions than answers. Yeah, and I think one thing to just, you know, emphasize to fellows is, you know, there's a lot of good literature that really talks about tear repair integrity and outcomes and how those don't correlate. So I think we have to be really careful when we talk about one question was, do we routinely order MRIs post-op? And Dr. Ainati said, if you do that commonly enough, you'll see so many of your cuffs fail, maybe more than you think. And I think that really the clinical correlation of them, there's a lot of literature that says that that doesn't necessarily correlate to outcomes, whether it be an ASES score, whether it be a patient satisfaction score or pain. 
So, I mean, uh, routinely ordering those things, I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that, but I do think that I would sort of tread lightly and think twice about it. I definitely don't in my practice. I don't know if you guys do in terms of a post-op MRI. I do not. No. Nope. I've got it for a reason. Good point. Thank you for answering the questions. You guys can keep going on. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ron. John, keep them coming. So, so at the second surgery, the treating surgeon, again, my partner, great surgeon, takes her back to um, surgery. The tear looks about the same and, you know, maybe a little smaller, but basically the same kind of tear and uh, minimal retraction. So, you know, we're thinking of Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Don't do the same thing again and expect a different result. So this time they say, aha, I'm going to do a double row repair, right? Get a little more footprint compression, get a little more time zero, a stability of the construct. You know, this might be the, um, you know, the right balance between stability and biology that we're looking for. So six so months Craig, after Craig, the can operation. Can I ask real quick, was there any signs of why it failed? Or is there anything that, you know, the no. partner sort of saw? Any pull through of the suture on the cuff side? Any, you know, anything that was uh, like a hint of why it might have failed? Anchors had not failed. Knots had co not come untied. I just, the tissue had just sort of pulled through a little bit. Um, which was odd because the tissue was not particularly bad. It just looked like it literally just had not healed and just kind of failed with fatigue failure over those intervening seven months. So not a real, so that was, that's the real head scratcher about this, right? Again, not a smoker, not a diabetic, not, no liver disease, elderly patient on and on, a little hyperlipidemia, but no other huge risk factors. So this patient's at their functional capacity evaluation after their two workers comp injuries while at the FCE, because they have an MRI before for this patient, then had the FCE, and then actually had an MRI after that showed that the tear occurred during the FCE. So the workers' comp attorney is like so excited. This is unbelievable. This patient is at a third workers' comp injury uh, from the same thing. And this guy's excited. The patient's not excited, though. The patient's painful. She's distraught. She's saying, I've done everything. The, the, my partner refers this patient to me, and at first I'm thinking, you know, this must be some kind of secondary gain issue. And it was the patient clearly was trying to do all the right things. She had been attentive to all of her physical therapy sessions. It really seemed like someone who genuinely wanted to get better. On exam, no stiffness, weakness, empty can testing. We're right back where we started. So I'll kick it over to the panel. Why don't we go to Josh this time? So Josh failed single row. Failed double row. I think I have an MRI next. Let me show you the MRI here, actually. Yeah, so MRI shows a tear, this time a little bigger than before. There's a few more anchors in the head than before, but it's basically the same scenario, supra tear. What, do you, what are you going to think for this patient now? Before well, you go yeah. on from, the, from sure. the questions asked, Josh, when you talk about this, could you comment and let everyone know what you're seeing for muscle quality, atrophy, fatty infiltration? Take us through the images so that the fellows and everyone sees what you're seeing. Sure, that's great. Uh, great question. So, looking at the uh, coronal in the center of the screen, um, to Grant's point, you know, it's you've got a retear. Uh, it's looking at that one slice. It's actually not retracted too much, but it doesn't look like there's much tendon left. So it looks like you know it's almost kind of just muscle at this point. I don't see a lot of you know, black tendon lateral to that. So. Even though it doesn't look too retracted, I think going back in there, you would not see a lot of good tendon tissue for another, you know, attempted repair, even if it's even going to come to that. Um, I, we need a few more. I'd like to see more sagittals in terms of looking at muscle quality, looking at, uh, you know, for, to better assess the degree of retraction. It doesn't look like there's too much atrophy on the one image we see here. And I don't know if Grant could add, add any color to that. Um, uh, there's there's no uh, fatty infiltration. I elected to do the Scrabble uh, joke there instead of including that important image. Sorry, Josh. No, sorry. I, I was like, I couldn't even read that. But yes, insipid is a good word. Um, so, I, you know, MRI wise, you know, that's, I, I think I'm not seeing anything terrible or terribly glaring here that would kind of explain the, the two re tears. Um, so I think for me, that gets to, issues of either a biology and you know what's frustrating in this case is that not a smoker you know you, you kind of ruled out a lot of the sort of high risk factors for things not healing um that said cholesterol you know is one issue but now that you've had two surgeries um two failed rotator cuff repairs done by good surgeons you know that looked like they were technically done with without terrible biology looking at it you, now you have to start kind of worrying if there's an infection or something else going on and that's where you know Maybe a workup for P. acnes or C. acnes at this point might be the route to go down. So that's a great point, Josh. I, I did not do that, but I totally agree that that's 
that a cold infection is probably a, um, a, a big, you know, one of the reasons why these things fail. Vani, for you, let's so, assume that it's not infected. Let's assume yeah. the muscle is good quality. Let's assume that you've got a little tendon loss, as Josh, I think, correctly pointed out on that MRI. Um, and how are you going to approach this patient? Well, you What's know, I mean, I think tactics? this is... Do you medialize a footprint, single row, double row? What are your, what are your tricks to... to yeah. How are, what are you going to have ready to confront this patient in the OR? Well, I mean, first of all, I think of poops as 30 points is like 60 points if you're in your third time doing this. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, I mean, I think we're, we're way above the Scrabble, like win on this. But, I mean, I think surprisingly, you know, the one thing I would say in a third time revision, I would have thought of real estate is another thing that no one's mentioned. And, you know, you've gotten two anchors. Now we're talking about four anchors and we're talking about... You know, you know, typically you see a lot more bone absorption and, you know, osteolysis around the anchors. So real estate can be a real problem in those. So, you know, I think I personally would have some ideas of some bone tunnel, maybe a non-anchor repair in some of those cases. So, you know, if you'd use any of these sort of um, not um, non-anchor repairs with the bone tunnels, that might be one option. And then the other thing is sort of, in terms of augmentation, you know, so you've tried mechanical augmentation. Now we need to talk about biological. And I think you got to approach it sort of systematically and say, okay, if you really believe the patient's um, a compliant patient, you know, one is both their biology and the sense is that, and then two is, I don't think we got a lot of detail, but I don't know, Grant, if you can tell, you know, what the patient's function is. Because, you know, you see a lot of these patients and they might be doing okay. I mean, I don't know how she was doing clinically. Yeah, yeah. She but has pain, uh, you know, lateral pain, pain with reaching, night pain, and weakness. She's basically got the classic kind of rotator cuff. Right. How old is she? Can you remind me? How old is she again? She's uh, she's in her 50s, I recall. Okay. I have to go back to the first slide. But she, you know, okay, what does she do for a living, Grant? What does she do for a living? Yep. Sorry, so, I didn't mean to interrupt. What does she do for a living? She works in retail. She works in like a clothing uh, store at the mall. Yeah. I mean, and she's then, hanging you know, clothes and shelving things. Very, Roger. fairly manual, but not you know. Super from, heavy. from the from the uh, from the Thanks, chat. Yeah, what do, what do you got? When would when would folks say we're not operating again, and then we're, 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 we we we're done? We tried twice and it failed. Well, I think that's a great question, um, and I think you know, I think that the answer to that for me is when you don't have options left. You know, at some point, look, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit, and you know, you've tried your best. I don't think we're there yet here now whether it's another arthroscopic procedure, you know, you could talk about patch augmentation, but I'd still be worried about the same thing that's causing this not to heal, getting a patch to heal on the tuberosity with less, less bone real estate, to Vani's point. Um, I'm not very optimistic about that. And we know that if you look at it, SCR literature, for instance, you know, healing's an issue. If it doesn't heal, they don't do well. So um, that said, you know, we have other options. She's a little on the young side, which is why I'd ask the uh, age, but you know, Lower demand, mid to high 50s, clearly reverse is something that could help her here. Um, so I don't think this is to the point yet where you say, we've got nothing to offer you, you got to live with it. But, you know, I would say, you know, to that point, I would say that there are patients I selectively choose not to. And I mean, a third time repair, you just have to be really sure that you have the right patient. I mean, compliance is a big issue, you know, and also a lot of comorbidities. I mean, I don't know. You know, I worked in Michigan for eight years, and I mean, some of those patients are not my most reliable and, and not the healthiest. So, I mean, I think in this particular patient, when we talk about a third time re um, redo, if she's not able to return to work, that might push me to consider a third time. I mean, and so those factors that are patient specific, I think need to become a very big discussion in that. Ronnie, well, I agree. Compliance is a big one and no surgical options, Josh. The other one would be for me, it's smoking. If the pay, I know smoking is a hard habit to kick, but if they're if they're a two-time loser and still won't stop smoking, I mean, I, I don't like to do revision cuff repairs mm -hmm. on smokers at all. I just think the results are so poor, and you know, if they're not fully invested and locked in in the success of that operation, I think it's I, I think um, you know you, you you need to consider your like, do I care more about their cuff than they do? 
So, and what about rehabbing her? Could we try? I mean, that's one of the points that got brought up and I think we should make a major like point of that is, you know, I will sometimes give patients, you know, at this point, you know, it's a timing issue and rehab. So there's a balance there and I don't think there's a right answer. How long do you rehab them so that you don't get more atrophy, more muscle loss in that case? But at the same time, you know, trial them to see if they might survive a non-operative and get to function and become in retail kind of semi-low demand. I think that's a good point, you know, because I'd also say, look, at this point, honestly, not that I don't care about atrophy, but I'm not going to do a, a try to repair the rotator cuff again. So even if it atrophies a little more, that's not going to affect the ultimate outcome of what I would do next. So to that point, I think rehab, even a cortisone shot, because I'm not worried about tendon healing in this case either, um, to see how functional we can make her and even, you know, kick the can down the road by her, by her a few years if possible. All right. Should we do the, the reveal here? So, so what I... What I did was um, took a surgery. You could see the old sutures in there and the tissue had just simply pulled through the, the suture. Uh, nothing else unusual. The tear didn't look, you know, awful. As you mentioned, some definitely a pockmarked tuberosity with some real estate issues. We did not have to use the, um, you know, a, a, an anchorless uh, device like a tunneler or the tensor medical one. Um, we were able to repair the tendon, but you can see not a lot of tendon left. We're really close to the muscular tendon disjunction there, as to Josh's point earlier. And then what I did, this is a posterior lateral viewing portal, is I, um, so the tissue quality looks good, retear the same. I said, I'm not, Einstein was right the first time. Well, well, he told me don't do the same thing again. But, you know, Einstein wasn't right about everything, right? You know, Einstein made some questionable calls in his life. So I'm wondering, maybe, maybe I should do something different uh, uh, still this time. So this time, we did a double row. This time we'll add the allograft dermis. So we added a two millimeter allograft dermis there as, an, as a biological and mechanical augment. And the data does show in, in a meta-analysis that that uh, does improve uh, the tear integrity. And then we added the biologic, the pixie dust, the BMAC, um, that, that a prospective blinded randomized trial uh, shows helps too. So, you know, we, we try to throw the kitchen sink as far as rotator cuff healing, that's all I knew. The patient was in severe pain, like terrible pain. She never had pain issues with her other operations, narcotics issues, basically um, uh, kind of like a shoulder hand syndrome kind of scenario with hand swelling and, you know, with thinking that something went wrong with the shoulder because of her prior experience, we got an MRI much earlier than I normally would at four months. And you can see here, um, I don't know if my, my pointer will project on the screen, but there's the dermis is here and that is healed. The rotator cuff is healed. So we got the tear to heal, but the patient is miserable with this now chronic pain, shoulder hand type syndrome, stellate ganglion blocks, et cetera. So I'm kind of curious, do you ever have these patients that have been blocked multiple times, you know, multiple shoulder issues, and now you get these weird kind of pain syndromes? How do you manage those, Josh? What do you deal, how do you approach that patient? Yeah, those, those as you said, you know, they suck. Um, and sometimes it's not even multiple surgery. Sometimes it's just kind of one, you know, the, uh, if they, but especially when they've had multiple hits, um, I, you know, I really focus on uh, aggressive, like kind of OT in addition to their physical therapy. Um, I'll have them wear a glove, anything to kind of get some of the stiffness and the, you know, the, the swelling from their hand, because they can't make a fist. It's really frustrating. Um, and I would have done exactly what you did though, like refer them to kind of my, my sort of chronic pain slash neurology group. Um, and whether it's a, a nerve block or, you know, they've got, a bunch of different things now for, you know, for um, CRPS. But I do find that it typically gets better. It's kind of a long road, which is annoying. It's frustrating for the patients. Um, but OT seems to make a big difference there and, and really just getting them to kind of move their hand as much as possible. But that's, it's frustrating because I've seen this before where you finally get their cuff to do well, their shoulders actually feeling good and it's their hand that limits them more than anything else. That's exactly what it was. And we did, I find that a corticosteroid injection can be helpful in these cases, for the shoulder, but also for the hand, that whole sh shoulder hand uh, connection. And she ended up doing, you know, better eventually, but it was an extremely long road. It took a really long time. And, um, and I still don't know why she didn't heal those other two surgeries. So um, I think my conclusion for this is there are things we don't understand about cuff biology. This lady really didn't have any of the major risk factors and that, you know, rotator cuff surgery, certainly in the larger tears is a, is a humbling sport. So, so can I just bring up a couple other points? Can we backtrack? Yes, please, Bonnie. Some I'm, questions I'm, I'm taking it over here. to you, so bring up all the points you want. Oh, good. See, this is my residency. I haven't aged in like 15 years. Thanks, Grant. So, it's a great uh, picture. 
So, so and, and, and by the way, I need to work on my AV content and um, game throwing re um, recollection here. So, but um, trial mm -hmm. therapy, if we were to try, say we, you know, it's a second time redo. I mean, to be honest with you, the odds are against us. I mean, let's be honest, the literature says you're probably not gonna win on that patient, especially a worker's comp. You know, um, one of the questions that got brought up is therapy, how long do you wait? And then when do you re-image them? You know, personally, I, I will give them a three month trial of therapy if I do. And, I, and I'm gonna present a case that kind of touches on that. But I mean, I wait a long time because at this point, I mean, I really think the cat's already out of the bag. It's a third time redo. I mean, I'm not sure there's a right answer. You know, the literature would say somewhere between the six weeks and three month period, maybe that atrophy really or infiltration progresses. But, you know, I mean, and the other thing is, you know, the idea is sort of like the third time going into this with the workman's comp, are you ever going to get them back to work? I mean, what's the reality of that? I don't know you guys think I about I think it depends. The therapy piece depends on, you know, what your bailout is. If, if you're thinking reverse is your next step, if they yeah. fail therapy, well, then you've got all the time in the world. Yeah. If you're thinking that you're going to try to repair this and you think there was some acute event, you know, that changes things a little bit in my mind. Josh, what do you think? How long do you, how long would you give your trial therapy? No, I think you, you delineated it well because, you know, what, at the, the third time, again, I probably would have leaned more towards, you know, I, I would have done exactly what you did, which is go to there with the scope. Um, if it looked a lot worse and it was going to be a reverse, um, I, I think, or I, if I had talked with the patient before and, and they were kind of leaning down the road of reverse as opposed to trying to re-repair it for the third time, then I think we've got nothing but time. And I would have them do physical therapy for as long as they thought they were making progress. And if it's three months, if it's six months, whatever, if insurance is covering it and they can keep going, um, you're burning no bridges. I do think that, again, if you're going to get some, you know, I was pleasantly surprised to see how much sort of tending you had here, because I thought that if you're going to do anything with sort of a patch, it would have to be an SCR. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it was actually luckier in retrospect that you went in sooner um, and didn't kind of go down the path of another six months of physical therapy, because that could have retracted even more and then made that sort of, you know, impossible. So the two points I, I think I wanted to bring up specifically are, you know, SCRs and, you know, it is a salvage, but, you know, in, especially in a third time redo the cost, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that's a significant factor, especially if you're going to operate in an ASC and if you have any shares in it, I mean, there's something to be said about that. And then suprascapular nerve decompression. I mean, you know, Buddy Savoy has some good literature on these redo revisions, that we should be releasing all of them. I mean, there's a prospective, I mean, he randomized and had a, a, some good outcomes that improve motion and improve pain and improve function. So, you know, that might be a thought, especially for the hand shoulder syndrome that you talked about, you know, should we be considering that in all our redos? Bonnie, Bonnie, why don't you go ahead and pull up your case? And while we're pulling that up, Bill yeah. Levine is telling everyone that it's, I, I made a tension mismatch and she's in a lot of pain because I got the tendon advanced double row. And so now she's hurting because I really pulled that tendon over. And that may be right. He's a really smart guy. Um, would you have considered maybe medializing the footprint or doing a single row repair in the interest of, ha in the in, uh, in the interest of having more, uh, you know, sort of less tension uh, on the repair versus what I did to try to get more kind of footprint compression and stability, Josh, and then, and then Bonnie. Why I, mean, I think it's, yeah, it's, you know, look, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, I think it looked like you got, you know, got it back. And I think to go back to a single, the third time to do a single row, I don't think I'm helping the person. They, they didn't heal the first time with, you know, better quality tissue and all the things going for them. A single row didn't work. So I don't know why doing it here would have been better. Um, and doing the double row actually allowed you to kind of incorporate that patch a little more easily, I think as well, which I think did make a difference here. Um, I, I think the only thing I would add is what Bonnie said, you know, if you're worried about that tension mismatch, it does put some traction on the nerve potentially. So that might be the indication to release the suprascapular nerve. All right, thanks, Josh. Bonnie, why don't you take it away? Okay. Um, I um, clearly am not as entertaining. So guys, if I get invited back, I promise next time we'll have way more video and fun slides. But, um, but I just sort of wanted to cover another case and another point. Um, so Grant and I talked about it and you know, this is a, maybe a different perspective, but another failed um, rotator cuff. So let's just say that the story does not always end well. But a 54 year old female, she fell while walking her dog. She's a pretty healthy woman. She has a traumatic first time dislocation at 54 years old. She gets reduced and then she gets an MRI from the emergency room. Just to know she really doesn't have a lot of significant past medical or surgical history. 
but she does drink these five Bud Lights per day, which we all know is probably a lot more. And um, she has really poor dental hygiene. She's a really thin lady. I should have put the BMI was, you know, in the 20s. And she has some necrotic teeth and some real concerns on dental hygiene. She lives independently, is pretty active, not working currently, but um, mostly because she took care of her daughter, who's a family medicine resident of ours. So she shows up in my clinic two weeks after presentation of her, of her dislocation to the ER, and she's got this poor function. You know, her range of motion actively is 30 degrees. She's got, you know, very poor strength. Passively, I'm able to get her up. I got her to about 90, 100. She's a little apprehensive, I will admit, but she's really limited, unable to do her ADLs. So her MRI kind of looks like this. Um, I do have, uh, so she's got, um, do you, maybe one of you guys want to go through what you guys see um, just to help the fellows or, or does anyone, you know, maybe Grant, you want to take it away and see, describe what you're seeing here? Well, um, I'm seeing here, uh, you know, coronal cuts to the MRI and it looks like you've got a big rotator cuff tear there with significant retraction. Um, it does look like there's a little bit of high signal in the tuberosity, so that may be, you know, a question of how chronic this has been versus acute. Um, I don't see a lot of arthritis there. Uh, that's what I'm seeing on these cuts, and my zoom isn't letting me see the right screen. Oh, yeah, so it looks like there's uh, no significant subscap muscle uh, infiltration. The infraspinatus has kind of grade one, and the supra has maybe grade zero, grade one. So. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. You know, it looks like a big, like a fairly sizable super tear. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, what patient specific factors, oh, hold on. Let me just, um, you know, what patient specific factors bother you guys? Are there any things that you say, I don't care about, I don't worry about? I mean, Grant, you brought up that smoking's kind of a no-go. I mean, it might be a go, but a hesitant go. I mean, are there any hard stops for you guys? Are there any things when you're thinking about like a patient presenting like this that make you sort of hesitant to even consider surgery? I mean, I think if, you know, the, if the five um, beers a day is an underestimation, you know, really, I think even, you know, even if she was a smoker, even if she was diabetic or any of those things that we know are risks for not healing, I think, you know, she's young and, and you say, you know, lives alone. Like, I think you have to give her a chance to repair the rotator cuff. For me, really kind of the, the red flags would be somebody who's not going to be compliant post-operatively um, because then, you know, it doesn't matter whether she smokes or not, drinks or not, she's going to ruin the repair and then you're back, then we're kind of back at Grant's case. So, you know, from a medical comorbidity thing, I think it's just about patient counseling and, and explaining, you know, that they may be at a higher risk for, for not a great outcome. But kind of the hard stop for me would be somebody who, you know, just, drunk, um, non-compliant, not going to wear their sling afterwards. And we could talk about whether that's necessary or not, but not going to do physical therapy because they're not going to do well. So, and Grant, do you have any physical exam findings, any pitfalls that you look on these acute tears that you think we should make sure the fellows know about? I think uh, one thing that gets uh, kind of undersold in your training is how stiff these patients can get quickly. So, you know, the acute tears, they fall, they have this acute presentation, they maybe go see their primary care doctor or a non-operative uh, physician. And it might be, you know, six weeks before they get into your, you know, into your, into your office ready for surgery. And you've got the MRI and you see acute tear. Hey, let's giddy up. Let's do this. The problem is um, maybe, maybe not quite so giddy up with this patient, but they get very stiff. A lot of these are kind of diabetics, older patients. So I think it's really important when you see an acute tear, to just have them do some gentle supine, well arm assisted stretching right out of the gates because you don't want to be dealing with this acute big tear and stiffness. Then you've got two problems that are that you have to face. And I'd actually add to you know two and a half problems because there's there's actually good literature that shows that you know females, older, bigger tears, but also preoperative stiffness is going to be a risk factor for anchor pullout during surgery, particularly if you go to a you know a double row repair. So um, you know, it, it, that's not going to kind of dictate how I, you know, what I do, but I think it just further reinforces Grant's point that, you know, stiffness is not a great thing in these, in these patients. So she has an acute large tear, as Grant points out. She has atrophy. I mean, so it was super and infra involved, according to the slices. Unfortunately, I didn't have all of the imaging um, to give you guys today. But, um, 
you know, what do you do in those cases? Does everyone jump to surgery? I mean, in this case, what if she's stiff? Does anyone send them to PT, make sure their stiffness is resolved? Sometimes I do do that, I will be honest. I will try to send them to a short bout of, I call it prehab to get their motion. And then I, I plan on doing the surgery with a slight delay. And then do you optimize the patient? Would any of you guys say, you gotta quit drinking, you gotta get your teeth pulled, yes or no? What would you do? For me, the stiffness, we're assuming they may have stiffness, is a much smaller issue than the, the drinking. The stiffness, yeah. I can usually you can do a little manipulation beforehand, maybe a little caps release. Maybe at worst case scenario, deal with the stiffness after the cuff heals. That is a surgical problem. Me as a shoulder surgeon, can I can manage that. The drinking, though, if the patient is unwilling and or unable to do the rehab required of the operation, that's the problem. So yeah. I think you have to look them in the eye and see, are they going to be able to do the appropriate rehab? And, you and have I mean, to I'll tell you, I had one in my board collection. If you want the gift that keeps on giving, operate on a drunk person, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I mean, it is just an abysmal experience and it makes you question your abilities. So, I mean, definitely for me, I lived it once. I'm not going to live it twice. I'm not Einstein, but I know a little bit about myself to know not to do things to, to keep doing the same thing. So I told her she got to quit drinking. Luckily, she had a really motivated daughter who was a resident, so she really forced the issue. And then she got all their teeth pulled. She had dentures by the time she was ready. Now, this took a couple weeks. So the question is, an acute tear, how long will you wait? You know, do you guys, a lot of times we don't have choices. They present to us when they present. But are there any specific timelines? You say, you know, six weeks is your cutoff, two weeks. Where do you kind of go with that? Do you have any specifics on that? Josh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I was just, I mean, I, I don't have specifics. I think the acute tears, which which are, are rare, but great, because you know, a lot of times we'll see these sort of acute on chronics. This seemed to be just an acute tear. Uh, those, look, the, the healing's gonna be better if you treat it sooner, but I think to your point, you've got to optimize everything else. So it's a, it's a balancing act, and that's kind of more the art, uh, you know, as opposed to science. Um, so I think I'd rather wait six weeks if you could reliably get her to quit drinking and get the teeth out than repairing her day one and having her re-tear it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really that balancing act, and again, a discussion with the patient. Um, but I, I would say my answer here would be treat it surgically as soon as I can optimize the things that need to be optimized. Again, you're not gonna optimize everything, but if they were, if their hemoglobin A1C was terrible or through the roof, I, I try to get that a bit better controlled. If they're, you know, drinking a ton, if we can cut that down, um, then those are the things I'm going to manage. Grant, more. You, what do you tell a patient with an acute large tear? What do you tell them their outcomes are? Because I think as a fellow, you don't always learn the conversations you have in terms of their failure expectations, their success. I mean, what do you tell your patient? So in, in Chicago, I found this comes up a lot more than North Carolina, right? So we're getting into the nice part of the year. And so let's say you have someone with a cute cuff tear. They're like, oh, doc, it's finally nice weather. I can finally play golf. I can finally go outside. Are you telling me I have to have surgery now or can I just wait till the fall when I'm going to be indoors for six months? So that question of like, when is it acute? And then when is it chronic? I mean, the studies I know are the UCLA study that showed, that, or they said, you know, they looked at patients before three months and after three months, a time point that as far as I can tell, they picked arbitrarily. And the patients that were within three months did better and after. I don't think there's an inflection point at three months, but there's also a Mayo study that showed the same thing three months before and three months after. So, so for me, you know, I quote those studies and I try to, um, I try to get to an acute tear within three months of the injury. There's also a study showing that if you wait six months or more after cuff tear, the MRI will change significantly. So for me, you know, I, I try to get to it within three months. The sooner the better, you know, assuming that you've got the medical and social issues optimized. Okay. So what surgery do you? Massive cuff tear. We talked about it. You know, um, just right off the bat, is there a go-to? You know, we are currently doing a study where we, we're doing a prospective randomized study where we're, all, we're adding patches to these. As Grant kind of referred, there is some good literature to talk about augmenting biologically. To me, this is a woman that's not your optimal biologic patient. She's not a smoker, but, you know, she might have some risk factors kind of contributing to that. What do you guys do? Is there a go-to or would you, you know, would you, are you hesitant to do one or the other? Do you have any thoughts of that? I think infections also become a bigger discussion. You know, do you worry about that? What do you guys think about that? Josh, why don't you take that one? Um, sure. I mean, I, you know, so the first part of the question, you know, this, I, I you know, I, I liked, I, ironically, since I've started to do more SCRs, talking about patches 
is a much easier conversation than it used to be where I, I would say that the results were not great, but I think I now have a lower threshold to augment with a patch if it's necessary. But again, this was sort of, you know, it seemed to be an acute tear. Um, Drinking's clearly an issue, but like no other sort of biologic risk factors. Yeah. The, it did look retracted. There wasn't, you know, a lot of atrophy. Um, so, I mean, I think this is something that would typically respond pretty well to, a, you know, a double row where it did extend into the intraspinatus. So I'm going to want to use a double row just given the size of the tear. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's going to be a little bit of an increased risk factor for maybe not healing, but she's, you know, she's lower yet less than 60, 62. So for me, this would be a double row orthoscopic rotator cuff repair, unless I got in there and, and the tissue quality just kind of was deceiving or it wasn't good. And then I have a low threshold to sort of augment with a patch. Is there anything you guys think that with the massive cup tears that you have on deck that you might not have prepared anything at all? And especially with the tuberosity being some edema real estate wise, do you guys change your anchor selection for that? Do you change anything? That's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, my typical, sorry, Grant, go, you want to go ahead or? No, you got I was it. Say, you know, if I typically use, you know, kind of 4.75 millimeter anchors, mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, and a lot of times you'll see that edema in the tuberosity and it, it's really of no clinical relevance. You know, the bone quality is still pretty good when you're, when you're, um, you know, punching for your anchors. Um, and to be fair, she had an acute event. So you're going to see some edema in the tuberosity likely just when it dislocated. Um, by the time you operate on her, it may, that may have sort of resolved if you had gotten another MRI. All that said, if I have any, you know, or, or concern when I'm putting in the anchors on my medial row, I always have, you know, I'll have larger anchors for a lateral row. I'll have, you know, I use swivel locks. I'll, I'll have bigger swivel locks available. So if there's anything during the case that I'm concerned about either tissue quality or bone quality, I want to have more anchors around. I want to have, you know, the patch in the room just in case I'm going to have a low threshold to augment with those. Okay, so I'm going to, in means of time, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm just going to keep going through the case, you know, but the bottom line is, is I think everyone's really well aware. It's been well focused in the literature that size, retraction, and atrophy really matter. And then I think, you know, the characteristics that we talked about, mechanical strength, double row versus single, biology, and timing of surgery. So, you know, this is her, um, her cuff tear, and, you know, it's not a great picture on the left, but there was a, a little bit more extension, but what was, what was really sort of surprising on it, it was the really poor excursion. We were able to recreate the, med uh, the repair to the medial side and the footprint, but not really coverage over the footprint. So I felt biology might help her. So I-, uh, could I that, was, I mean, that was a beautiful picture. I would say, you know, not so surprising. If you go back to the MRIs that you had grant review, you know, there was not a lot of good tendon you yeah. know, lateral to the glenoid, if we look at those at the coronal. So yeah. um, I, I think you're having a patch there was, was the appropriate thing to do because it, you know, I, I would have been concerned about getting tendon back to the footprint as well. Yeah. So, and the bottom line hey, is, wait. is, you know. Can you go back, that's a really interesting point. Vani, can you go back to that? Because it'd be good to hear what Josh saw on that MRI that, that sent him that way. Sure. I mean, so Gus, if you can see, um, you, if you look almost where like the superior here. labor is, you, know, you see sort of, the, of right on the coronal here, there. I think. Can you There's not a ton of tendon there. Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about. I don't see a lot of tendon. And, if, and actually, again, part of it is also just knowing the history here. It was an acute event, dislocation. You could almost convince yourself that there's still some tendon left on the tuberosity, yeah. which also lets me know that there's not going to be a ton of tendon, you know, when I'm bringing the, the tendon and muscle back. Yeah, and I think the point Josh makes is really important because I think as a fellow, you sometimes miss it. And I think you have to really be prepared for augmentation or the conversation with the SCR sometimes in those cases. Because every once in a while, you'll be surprised how little tendon there is to repair. Okay, so anyways, um, in the means of, and Ranjan, cut me off whenever because I want to make sure we have time for questions from our audience because I know that's the important part here. But the bottom line is she does well. She doesn't do great. She does well for post-op. She improves to 90 degrees actively. Passively, I can get her up to about 150. Extra rotation is limited, but she never really regains full strength. She does better, but not. And to the point of everyone was sort of saying, when do you re-image? She progressed slowly, but surely, but very slowly. And so by nine months, she's like doing okay. She's living her life. And then she feels this pop in her shoulder. You know, and then she basically goes downhill. She loses her range of motion, loses her function, and then has increased pain. So, I mean, it's the gift that keeps on giving, as we talked about. And, you know, failed rotator cuffs are just never, to me, the thing that you want in your office. And if you become an expert in it, God bless. But, but you know, the bottom line is, is I don't have the imaging for him post-op because she ended up getting it in an outside place. But the bottom line, she ends up showing up with this MRI and this basically this poor outcome and her MRI shows a massive re-tear. 
this I would go stuff. body, just, in, sorry to interrupt, just for the fellows, if you go back one slide, I mean, your, your x-ray was very telling because there's a very high riding humeral head there. Um, yep. So I think this pop she felt at nine months, that may have been kind of the straw that broke the camel's back, but she yes. probably you know, didn't heal from the beginning. I agree. Uh, just, and I think that that's the point I want to emphasize. You know, we don't always know what the imaging looks like, but yet our clinical exam sort of tells us a different story. And so, you know, I don't have interval imaging. You know, maybe I, if I did, but I'm not sure I would have done anything different. Right. You know, I'm not first to jump on a repair or revision repair if someone's doing well. And so the patient was doing fairly well. She really didn't come back until that nine month. Um, she came up to six months and then I lost her. And so, you know, in that case, when you're a fellow, I mean, I think the point sort of is, is just showing a different option. I PT'd her. I sent her to therapy. With the idea of a 54-year-old, my salvage is Josh Shed is in reverse. So in those cases, you know, I mean, it might not be the right answer. I don't know the story. We don't know the literature on these, you know, these massive cuff tears without arthropathy. But I know for me, I wasn't excited to go back in and repair this woman especially with the MRI sort of really showing not much to repair. So I sent her to therapy, I gave her an injection, and then she just didn't do well. She just was one of those, some of those patients do, and, and you know, I had a case to show, but in this case she didn't. And so, you know, the thoughts at this point was really, she ended up with these options. You either do a reverse or I do a revision or I do an SCR. Really should have emphasized SCR in this case, because in a younger patient, that might've been the answer. Although if you look at her function, she really didn't improve enough. The SCR might not be the right answer in this patient. And hey, then, first of all, I want to remind everybody on the call, like send in your questions now because yeah. we're going to jump for general questions. But I would say too, Vani, when she was recovering from the surgery, you know, you had concerns about her compliance and everything. Did she do what she was told? Did she go to her PT oh, yeah. sessions? Because sometimes visual. arthroscopic surgery can be kind of a test balloon, you yeah. know, before you buy it with an arthroplasty. Yeah. No, she was probably one of my most compliant patients. So it's just, she was doing well at six months. And so she was doing well enough that we just didn't have her come back till three months. So we just didn't see her in that interval. And the ir irony of it is that then she has this acute tear at the nine month period. I don't know if anyone's going to comment. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you know, both just for the fellows, you know, because you'll, you'll do cases on your own and you'll walk out of the OR because the pictures look great. Both you guys, girls did you know great jobs patches are not easy to work with it's almost easier to do an scr than i think than to kind of augment with you know mm -hmm. over a repair and you guys both of them look beautiful um so that's one of those you walk out of the door you pat yourself on the back you're like i did great and then you know fast forward three six nine months yeah, and you're exactly. like oh shit you know so, so and that's it i mean that's the thing and the, those are the ones that bite you are the ones that you know and then you, that you've married them right so this is your your relationship with your patient it's a marriage and you know, whether you want them around or not, they're gonna keep coming back. And so, so you know, in these cases, it's kind of a tough sell because you know, you think you do great and then you sort of are stuck with what do you do? And so, you know, she ends up getting a reverse. And so, you know, just another option for a failed repair that I put out there just to sort of contrast, you know, um, gr grants there. And it's just something just to consider. And, and I think she was the right patient. She had tested her time. And she'd really shown signs of cupped arthropathy by the end. Great result, yeah, Bonnie. Great. Uh, Ranjan, should we open up to some yeah. questions from the audience? Yeah, so I have a couple of them for all of you. So yeah. a couple of folks have asked uh, along the way, the workup for infection. Well, how aggressive are you going to do that? Are you going to do biopsies, grow them out before your revision? Especially, Grant, in your case where it was done three times, like what was would you have asked the question from one of the panels was uh, from the audience was instead of the third procedure actually doing a repair, how about actually taking tissue and letting it grow out and making sure that you don't have uh, propranium bacter or I'm sorry, cutie bacter uh, and, and, and sort of thing. Yeah. So if you're going to do or if you're going to do arthroscopic biopsy, you should know that there is a 15 to 20 percent false positive rate for C. acne's growth. So we did a study where we took sterile gauze sponges and grew them in the lab, and 15% of those grew out C. acne's. That's approximately the same percentage that you see as unexpected positive cultures in uh, revision arthroplasty that are felt to be non-infected. In other words, there's a background of false positive rate in addition to the true positives, and we don't have a great way to tell the difference since the true ones don't elevate the ESR, CRP, et cetera. So in, in answer to your question, the workup I do is uh, if I, I um, 
you know, with that case, now what I would do is we'd still get ESR, CRP. Now, c acnes is not going to elevate that, but um, that is, I think, part of the workup for any infection in general. And then we'll do five cultures. You want to use a different uh, pituitary runger or, or, um, or, uh, or grasper for each yeah. one. You want to do it through a cannula and you mm -hmm. want to put it directly into the culture medium and not have it go onto a gauze sponge or be manipulated with the nurse's fingers. So that's kind of the best practice. That's what the um, International Consensus Meeting Study Group, uh, there's actually a JSCS article on proper uh, culture culturing technique and, uh, Grant, can, issue. and that's the that's the preferred way to do it but i would um, also aspirate pre-op you yeah. know i bet you that with grant's case i would, I would get an aspiration sometimes you can't get much but you can lavage and, and you know none of these things are perfect but i do get a pre-op aspiration and, and, and I, have a, I would oh sorry oh go ahead no i was just gonna say you know with grant's case you know once you kind of made if i had made the decision to do an arthroscopic revision again I would have had, you know, maybe taken some culture at the time, but I, I would have proceeded with the repair. But had I gone down the road of an arthroplasty with two failed previous road to cuff repairs, that's when I would have staged, gotten, you know, soft tissue biopsies and just tried to, you know, in my mind at least, rule out infection as best I could before putting an implant in. And then I, I could have just, shown one of those cases also where you really start to get a bad path. And just um, two other points. One other is just that Grant sort of taught me, and I would just say from that um, consensus meeting, you know, that the, 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 there's an easy way that people talk about in the, you know, in the, um, uh, the Neptunes to try to catch these specimens. And that really isn't a great way to, to, to evaluate for infection, but it's a common thing that's done. So just to, from a fellow standpoint, I would avoid that because, you know, that is something that sort of miss the t tissue is morselized and I not I really like sort of emphasize to me that that's really not an accurate way of, of, of evaluating for piacnes. And then just um, another question that was brought up is, um, you know, just the uh, humeral head migration and just the fact that, you know, making sure you get x-rays and that's something that we should make sure we emphasize for all these cases, you wanna make sure you get radiographic imaging because you know your MRIs, your CTs are laying down, they're not always supine and you don't always get that and that, you know, the hematic classification and when you start to see proximal migration, you're going down a different path. So just another point of emphasis. Bonnie, there's Especially a lot of questions considering SCR. about that. So yeah, if you're SCR, gonna consider SCR, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go I ahead. I think we're saying the same thing, Grant, go ahead. Those. No, go ahead. I was just gonna, you know, I was just gonna say, you know, we as we've gotten a little more granular in our uh, analysis of SCR outcomes, when you start getting to the kind of Hamada four, even you know, three Bs, those are the ones that are not going to do well. So I think X-rays are critical as part of your workup. So one thing on the X-ray is, I totally agree. When you have that decreased acromial humeral interval, you have to be really worried about SCR. For me, I do a physical exam test where I kind of, I do basically do a sulcus maneuver and have the patient relax their deltoid, pull downward on the arm. And if I can get that humerus to pull down onto a normal station, I feel like there may be, um, they may be in the game for an SCR. But if that humeral head is stuck up against that acromion, I believe you have no hope to even accomplish the operation, let alone have a successful result. But I, I do think I have had some where the acromion humeral interval is decreased. If I can dynamically pull it down when the patient's relaxed into their EUA or relaxed in clinic, I do think that is a successful uh, candidate for a SCR, though they may be higher risk than someone who didn't have that narrowed space. So two questions. One, this is for you, Vani, the, uh, the group. Uh, there are a couple of questions about the patient has low BMI and unhealthy. Did you get an albumin level? And, we did. And if, did you work to get uh, see if that needed to be reversed and yeah. optimized before you did the surgery or not? Yeah, yes, but you know, I looked at the literature and I don't know if there's a lot out there. I mean, we know about lipids, we know about hypercholesterolemia. I don't know to say that there is, you know, an optimal nutrition level, but we did do that because we had time. And, you know, and, and that was something that we did sort of consider. So, I mean, I don't know how much that affects the biology, but we definitely did both of those things in this patient. Okay, so final question for, for everyone in the panelists. Um, the, and the first, uh, so there are two questions and we'll go from Grant, Josh, and Vani. One is, what percentage of your practice for rotator cuffs, if you're not in a trial, are you using patches? And two, when, uh, when the balloon spacer gets approved, where do, where do you see that in your practice? Mm -hmm. And so we'll start, uh, those two questions for, uh, we'll end the night with, for, with, each, with a perspective for, for each of the three of you. Pa yeah, patch, thanks, how many patches and, and balloon spacer? 
So for me, um, you know, my partner at Duke, Allison Toth, has got some largest series of patches in the published literature. And so I was really in the, on the patch train and I, I still use a fair number of patches, but with the SCR um, and then some of my kind of being more cognizant of kind of medializing the footprint, a single row for some of the bigger tears, I feel like the ro role for the patch has decreased. I'm doing more SCRs and then more kind of, um, so what percent? Kind of single row, crimson duvet for the big ones. Uh, for the balloon, I don't see a lot of role for that for me. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not a, a believer in the balloon. I've seen some bad data uh, out of Europe and I'm still, uh, I'm still a skeptic. So you have to give me some more data to convince me on that one. Josh? Um, so to your first question in terms of like percent of patch, I'm actually a little different than Grant in the sense that I, I randomly, there was just a lot of downtime looking at the numbers. I do probably about 120 rotator cuffs a year. I probably do use 20 patches. Now that could be SCRs or augmentation. And I think since I've, so probably about 15 or 16% if you're asking percent wise, I think since I started to do SCRs, I, you know, there wasn't great patch data before, uh, but I think newer studies that have shown that there is some benefit. And I think since I've done, taught, done more SCRs, I'll have the conversation with patients more and I'll have a lower threshold to augment with a patch, um, you know, even if it's not a frank SCR. So I think I'm using some patch type or graph, you know, probably 15, 17% of the time. In terms of the balloon, yeah, I'm gonna need to see better data. I mean, I think the problem with these sort of massive irreparable cuffs, you can do anything from a debridement and a biceps tenotomy tenodesis to a marginal convergence, to a partial repair, to an SCR, to a tendon transfers, to a reverse. We don't have great data. You know, there's no great studies kind of comparing all of them to show you what's gonna do great. So I think adding another thing to that milieu um, without great data is not very appealing to me. So I, you know, I, for me, there's not much indication at this point and maybe I'll change in a few years. I mean, I mean, I don't think there's a lot more to add. I'd say 10, 15% of my practice, I would do a patch, so a similar rate. And then I think the only thing I would sort of say is that when we talk about all these, the only thing that hasn't been touched upon is the cost value. Um, and I think that's going to be a future discussion that we all need to be relevant about, that the fellows need to understand, because, I mean, the cost of a patch is not insignificant unless reimbursement suddenly going up. I'm not sure that that's a, a, a non-existent point. And then I think the balloon space was the same thing. I think if you look at the comparable literature, the consideration from an SCR comparison, I mean, I think that that is a cost value consideration that we just have to touch upon in there. I agree though, I just don't think that there's enough data yet to support you know, that. I think the SCR literature also needs to grow for us to really feel comfortable with that. All right. Well Thank you everybody for your time. Our hour is up and uh, for an incredible time. Dr. Mazaka, any final words for the group? No, thought it was a great session. Uh, good flow and uh, you know, nice job. Thank you everybody. Have a good Thanks, night. Guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Bonnie. Thanks, Josh. Thanks.